here in this room is a will. You're gonna purchase, purchase. Not leave him alone. You're gonna greasy. We'll find out if any of Eddie's killings were on a full moon. Hey, that's a lot of Hollywood baloney. Your classic werewolf can change shape anytime it wants, day and night, whenever it takes a notion to. That's why I call them shapeshifters. I got a dozen books on it. What about killing it with silver bullets? Well, sure. Silver bullets are fire. It's the only way to get rid of the damn things. They're worse than cockroaches. They come back from the dead if you don't kill them right. Plus, they regenerate. You know what that is? Cut off an arm, cut off a leg, stick a knife in a heart, nothing. They may look dead, but bam, three days later, they're as good as new. You believe in this? What am I, an idiot? I'm making a buck here. You want books? I got books. I got chicken blood, I got dog embryos, I got black candles, I got wolf paint. Look at this. Silver bullets. Some joker ordered them. 3006. Never picked them up. I take Bank America, American Express, Visa. You gonna buy that or what? Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault Podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be taking a look at werewolves, the origins of werewolves. Um, it's actually a listener request from my good friend Nick Isaacs. Um, he asked me if I could have a look at doing this episode for him. Um, so I'll say is that I would say most people, if not all of you that are listening to this today, um, I'm going to know what a werewolf is and know what it looks like. Um, it's, a, it's a beast that can transform and it's very popular today, I would say, in Hollywood and TV. Um, especially with films like uh, American Werewolf in London, uh, Dog Soldiers, The Universal, Wolfman. And not to forget Joe Dante's The Howling from, uh, I think it's 1981, which is the clip that you would have heard at the beginning of this episode with... Uh, uh, one of my favourite uh, actors uh, is Dick Miller explaining about what silver bullets, which I'll get into later on, which is very important. So um, you've got lots of things with werewolves, like I say, on how to kill them, how you can, how a human can turn into one, and this is what the episode today is going to be about. Is that, uh, like I say, most of us know. Well, werewolf is, but what's the origins? Where have they come from? When did we start talking about werewolves? Um, so before I do any, before I did any research today, the first thing that came to my mind was that when you go right back in time, which I always do with these episodes, you go back to to year dot. I would imagine that you know, as uh, Neanderthals, we would have spent a whole lot, a lot of time with animals you know it would have been man versus beast so in those times it would have been a survival instinct for for us humans to to fight animals and survive so I imagine in those times it would have been a curiosity to for us to think we are not the dominant race the the animals back then would have been ferocious um, you would have had Let's just say, for example, the saber-toothed tiger that's out there that wants to kill you, and you've got the caveman that are trying to verse that. And I imagine that would have been a trophy win back then to try and kill kill that with the weapons that they would have had. And you come away and you go back to your, to your tribe, and the campfire tale probably would have been that if you killed a beast like that, it probably would have been a trophy. And on top of that, it would have been a curiosity. And then on top of that, I'd imagine that they, when they wore their pelters, um, they probably wanted to try and mimic it because they honoured the the beast back then. So I think that's our, that's our origins. That's the first thought that comes to my mind. Um, then I did some research and then moving along, um, you look at, say, like the Egyptians. Uh, they had like the god Anubis that looked, looked like sort of half man, half beast, especially the head. It's like he's got a head of a werewolf. Um, and then when you look at the hieroglyphics, there's a, and I've seen programs on this as well. Um, you can go really deep into this, especially with the Egyptians. Um, they look like they have um, half humans, half beasts. So, you know, the half head of a um, an alligator or a crocodile. So there's always been this this thing about humans and beasts. 
in, in history. So I'm just looking at the foundations there. That's where you've got to take your mind back to. And then the next thing you've got to add to this building block, block that I'm creating is it isn't just one uh, civilization or just one country around the world that talks about werewolves. It is everybody. The same as when I spoke about the vampires. Everybody had a story about a vampire. So the werewolf is the same thing. And people talk a lot about shapeshifters and also the word lycanthrope which is uh, something that we'll get into in a minute and I'll tell you where the origins of that comes from um, but yeah I'm shifting between time periods back and forth but just to try and explain this so now what I've said is you, you've got the ancient times the, the Neanderthals you've got the, the Egyptians I'll get, onto, I'll get onto the Greeks in a minute because this is where you actually get the first um, recordings of a, a lycanthrope shapeshifter character um, but before I get into that so let's just go right up to today and the difference between the ancient times and today is that we um, we don't go out as such to, you know, challenge or fight beasts like we used to back in the time. We don't have saber two tigers out there running around trying trying to kill us. Um, so modern day civilization has become, you know, quote unquote civilized in, in a way where we can go down to the supermarket and buy food. Um, but but what what's happened is those those old stories that have that have built our civilizations talking about you know man versus beast are still in the shadows they're still there they haven't gone away and this is where i would say the story of the werewolf comes in is there still something out there that can can shape shift and turn into the beast and this is where these these monsters come from and now they these old stories have been now you know transformed no pun in that uh, and now used for Hollywood and and TV. And if you dig a little bit, if you dig a little deeper into this, you you work out that you find out that these are old folk tales. And so now talking about folk tales, let's move on to that. So let's go back to um, the Greek times uh, and having a look at some research. This is where you have the first recording of um, a lycanthrope uh, character. And this story actually originates from um, a poet called Avid from the first century. And he talks about an ancient Greek king called Lycan. And he was a, he was a horrible king. Um, he murdered people. He didn't care. And he was so cruel that he actually got a visit from Zeus himself. And he came down and he said, you've got to stop all this. Um... And what Lycan did was that he offered a meal to Zeus and he almost, well, he tried to trick Zeus basically by putting human flesh into the meal of Zeus just to trick him, you know, just to annoy him. And Zeus being a god that he is, he knew that that human flesh was in there. So to punish Lycan, he turned him into a wolf and the, his punishment here was that he was going to spend the rest of his life as a wolf to go out there and heat human flesh as a punishment and this is where you get the name lichen king lichen lichen throat which we now are familiar with 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 werewolves and the word lichen means one that can transform into a beast then uh, there was lots of stories like this around the greek times and the roman times they were talking about creatures that can transform about werewolves you also had a greek historian called herodicus in the 5th century BC and he said in his travels he came across a, a population of people called the Murians and once a year they would turn into a wolf for several days they would do the transformation and then after that period they would then uh, return back to being a human being so you've got another um, story there from from that time, ancient time period and having a look at the research here there is a lot of stories which I could go to, into and I'll probably spend quite a few hours talking about this but I'd like to keep um, the show condensed to about 30 minutes just to give you that little bit of a, a bite-sized telling of this story. Uh, the other one that I found quite interesting here as well is moving on from the Greeks and then you had the Romans and 
these people were talking an awful lot about this. Is these were like the campfire tales of um, people transforming into animals. And the other one that I like here as well is the actual moving on to the uh, the eighth or the ninth century, uh, the time of the Vikings. Um, so when you think of a Viking, you know they had horns on their helmets. They were very very tough, very ferocious, very very honourable. And now what they believed in was that they were in touch with with animals, uh, particularly bears and wolves, thinking that they were the the hierarchy. They were, they were the guys in charge. And if you if you honoured a wolf, and if you gained the characteristics of a wolf, and you went into battle, you would have the upper hand. So what they did was that the they would use the pelters of a bear or a wolf and they would cover themselves in it and when they went into battle they would carry the characteristics and they they think that that would give them the like say the upper hand in battle and the name for this was called a Barz barzak you would become a barzak and you would have like you'd be magically infused and become out of control to go into this, you know, fear this battle. And that's where the actual word berserk comes from, which we use today, which kind of makes sense, you know, because, you know, if someone goes out of control, or we say it, you know, in, in popular culture today, oh, someone's gone berserk, they've gone out of control, or if someone's annoyed about something, we say, oh my God, he's gone berserk about it, you know. And these are interesting things when you look at it, you know, when you think about, Someone at one point is being pretty cool, you know, about their business, and they can be the calmest person in the world. And then some, they get some information that something's gone wrong, and you know, we've all got it in our body. And this is the other interesting thing when you think about werewolves. We, we as humans, have these rage instincts, and that is fact. Everybody listening to this, there's a moment where you've either stubbed your toe. It can be anything like that, or you've cut your finger, and you've just gone into like a, a little rage where you've gone, ah, damn it. So that is a transformation in itself, isn't it? Because you've gone from calm, and then you've gone berserk. And then when you look at the word berserk, it actually goes back to the time of the Vikings, when they were wearing pelters to become these some something else. So it's almost like it's in our instinct. And this is... This is the way I'm trying to explain the werewolf is that when you look at history, our building block is from the animals, from the time of the caveman, the Egyptians and folklore and the Greeks and the Romans, then the Vikings, and then you're moving on to, uh, you know, modern day, uh, you know, culture and folklore towns and so yeah, when you when you really think about looking at this, you know, werewolves it, it is quite an important topic about us as humans, really. When you think about it, um, so I kind of skipped a little bit here. Um, now let's talk about the Middle Ages because this is kind of like the real stamp to what we've got today. Um, back in Europe, particularly, um, wolves were most mostly feared feared in Europe. They were dangerous predators. There's an awful lot of stories about wolves um, invading villages and people having to, um, you know, raise the bar to go out and hunt them. Uh, soldiers being employed, um, and as I said, they were a sim symbol of the night because you know they, they went out in packs and, you know, if you had a full moon, you know, I haven't mentioned that yet, but that's where you know the wolves come out and hunt. Um, and then you've also got um, stories like uh, Little Red Riding Hood, you know, from the Brothers Grimm, um, talking about, you know, that, that, that famous story, you know, about the, the girl visiting her grandmother, the grandmother gets killed by a wolf, and then um, the wolf in, imitates the grandma. Uh, it's a great story, quite terrifying, actually. Again, that's another word that we use today. Um, grim, we usually say something's grim. And that goes back to the Brothers Grimm's writing. You've got um, Peter and the Wolf, the Russian story. And you've also got the story of the boy that, that cried wolf. Um, and that also goes into um, 
you know, talking about that phrases that we we use as well. You know, got to keep the wolves away from from the from the door. Um, that's something that we use use today as well. I think it's usually if you say someone earns a bit of money and they say, yeah, that yeah, you know, I've earned a bit of extra money this week. Keeps keeps the wolves away from the door. Just just expressions that we use. <laughs> But going back to the Middle Ages now, back in this time, it was a hard, hard time. Um, it is romanticised today, but back in those times you had plagues, you had poverty. Um, people struggled, people lived in, in villages. Um, the population was less and the, the, the terrain was probably more vast, so you probably had more more forests back then. and. There probably would have been more more curiosities. There would have been folk tales. Uh, you got to remember you had the uh, the witch trolls back in these times, around about the uh, 16th, um, 17th century, and that kind of goes back to you know when you think about like the Brothers Grimm's and the fairy tales and that that time period. Um, yeah, and like I say, people had plague, they had poverty, and I think people just wanted something to directly blame. Um, so they would probably come out and tell tales of, you know, is this something to do with witches? And when people talk about witches, they also talked about werewolves and uh, transformations because werewolves were out there um, causing problems with uh, villagers. Um, you also had people that were living on their own as well, like hermits living in caves. And these people would be blamed with these stories there's a there's a story in france uh, of a hermit called Gilles de may um, in the city of dole and he lived as a hermit and a lot of people when they saw him they thought that he actually looked like a wolf because of you know he's looked disheveled his hair was long um, his eyebrows joint together he had a beard and there was an incident where there was a little girl that got attacked by a wolf and people were convinced that this was Jill de May. They thought that this wolf carried the characteristics of him and that he transformed into this. Um, so they killed the wolf and they brought Jill de May to trial because of this, because they thought that he was a wolf, that he was responsible for this. And he was burnt at the stake at the time, which is what happened, you know, like I say, with the, with the witches and the witch trials. As I mentioned earlier, there were, there were literally hundreds of stories like this out there, which I was quite surprised with when I looked at the research. And and one of the places in Europe which was really prolific for for people fearing werewolves was actually France. In 1520, well, between 1520 and 1630, um, 30,000 people were brought to trial accused of being werewolves. 30,000 people in that time. Um, there's, you know, instance of people thinking that it was werewolves, which is crazy. I, I never realised this, to be honest with you. I thought there'd be a few stories kicking around, which I've just mentioned, but, you know, that volume of people is <laughs> it's higher than I thought it would be, to be honest with you. Um, so it's safe to say that the Middle Ages really put a staple on the, the werewolf folklore, uh, particularly what we what we have today. Um, now the other thing I looked at here is um, how, how do you deal with a werewolf and typically in uh, you know in, in popular culture today especially in Hollywood when you watch movies the only way that you are famously going to kill a werewolf like you kill a vampire you know with a stake through the heart now with a werewolf is a silver bullet um, which the first thought that comes to my mind is when I spoke about vampires you know it is it's a, it's a, it's pure um, silver. It's a pure commodity. Um, he has connections with, uh, I suppose you could say the Christianity. Um, with, as I mentioned, with vampires, you know the story of Christ, where um, Judas got paid off with, you know, I think it's thirty coins of silver or something like that. So you kind of got that connection there. So I imagine that could probably bridge in into this uh, as well. But one of the stories which connects to this is again, um, is going back to France in the 18th century. France are taking it all here uh, with these stories, surprisingly. Um, so between 1764 and 1767, you've got the story of the Beast of 
Geverden. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, you had a wolf attack where um, 610 people were killed. Um, and it was quite a, quite a ferocious killings where you had throats torn out. And the Kingdom of France wanted something done about this. They spent a lot of money and manpower because they're thinking, we can't have this. Uh, this, is, this is a problem. Um, so they, they employed um, the army and they also commissioned um, hunters to go out there and, and kill these wolves. And there was a hunter called Jean Chassel. And he was using ordinary rounds to try and kill these beasts. And apparently they weren't working too well. Um, because they were saying that the beast had this uh, very thick hide. Almost like a sort of bulletproof vest to stop them from getting killed. Um, so he thought, let's use some silver bullets to see how that works. And the silver bullets penetrated these wolves. Um, apparently, this is this is all. As far as I know, this story is true. This probably goes into a little bit of a sort of mythical um, dissertation of the story. How true you want to, you, you take it with a pinch of salt, but. Um, so to use silver bullets I kind of like this story I think it's quite good um, it worked they dealt with the werewolf problem so I've said this before you can imagine that um, old Jean Chastel probably you know did what he needed to do saved the day become a hero and then afterwards probably went down to the local inn got himself a few pints and then told the locals and they were saying oh, how did you do it oh silver bullets that sounds quite cool well, where'd you get the silver bullets from then? Apparently he said that he had some type of relic from the Christian telling of you know the Virgin Mary from that time. And he used this silver to melt it down into bullets. And he said that is that is what worked. It had like a some sort of Christian faith in the, in the bullets to be able to sort of kill, kill, kill these werewolves. Apparently that's where this story comes from. Um, and... I'll be honest with you guys, I typed this <laughs> typed this one into Google and this is what, what came up. Um, so I kind of like that. So you can imagine that kind of makes sense from this time period, the 1700s. You could imagine that this story floated around. You kind of had that hearsay thing. <clears throat> people, people got hold of this story and it moved on and it went into the folklore tales. And then people began to believe that the way you're going to kill a wolf is with a silver bullet. So that's that's where it comes from. But like I say, you take that with a, with a pinch of salt. So, we're at that point now where it's safe to say that Europe really stamped these stories. These stories are out there, the folklore tales. And then on top of that, you've got the stories from, as I said, the, you know, the Brothers Grimm, uh, the Peter, Peter and the Wolf, the Boy Who Cried Wolf um, stories. Um, and werewolves became a... I guess you could say like a household name if they were kind of getting the blame for something that was going wrong. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't just Europe, it was, it was all parts of the world that believed in shapeshifters. Um, I won't go into this too much, but what I will mention is that you have other stories, especially in America, you have the, the Wendigo, the, the I think it's the Bray Beast of uh, Wisconsin. Um, you've got uh, the the dogman um, so you've got all these other stories from around the world that, that talk about um, shapeshifters and it's worth mentioning now you've got uh, modern day stories even today you know you've, you've heard of the uh, I think this was back I'm sure I think it was back in the 90s we had the beast of Bodmin more people thought there was a uh, some sort of wild I think it was a wild cat from a ex escaped from a zoo or something like that but it, again it was a big thing in the newspapers I remember back then some beast roaming roaming the um, Bodmin Moors. Um, so yeah, we still like to tell these stories. And then moving on today, uh, so you go to the uh, like the 19, I think it's the 1940s, Universal, and you have uh, Lon Chaney Jr.'s Wolfman, the famous black and white werewolf movie, which probably starred it all. Um, it took off in Hollywood, and then after that, today, we now have... As I mentioned earlier, a couple of movies like American Werewolf in London, a big hitter. Um, 
dog soldiers was a favourite of mine, not say the, the howling. Um, so it is, it's, it's reinforced itself in, in culture today when we talk about, um, you know, a monster uh, protagonist along with like werewolves, um, not werewolves, uh, vampires as well. So there's the uh, folklore tales and the movies. Let's move on to actual medical conditions. Now there is a medical condition called, now bear with me on this because I'm trying to pronounce this, hypertrichosis. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, so a registry disease where your entire body gets covered in hair. There's a couple of rare cases like that. Um, there's also the um, transmission of a disease between an animal and a human, which is the rabies, um, which is a horrible disease, which talk, causes you to, um, you know, froth from the mouth. It's, it's a horrible thing. But again, it's that, I suppose it's, you know, when you think about werewolves, you know, how, how, how does someone turn into one? Um, they either get bitten or scratched. So I guess that is a plausible thing where you could catch something like rabies and was that perhaps something that possibly happened in ancient times where someone got bitten and they didn't realize the medical um, term back then and they saw someone catch this disease and then transform into possibly a rage or something like that and looked like they were probably transforming into something where they were just um, dying of a, a, a terrible disease so it's, it's kind of like a sort of interpretation I guess um, there's also a story here of a. Uh, this is back in the 1600s. There was um, a child called uh, Peter the Wild Boy who was found in Germany and, and he was found living in the forest. He was, you know, looking after himself but he was walking around on all fours. And there have been stories like this where children have grown up with animals um, and they have picked up. Um, Animal, animal instincts. Uh, Peter the Wild Boy was actually found by the royal family back then. I think it was King William the Third, and he was brought back to England, and he lived in the palaces back there. Um, so there you go. That's that is the origins of the werewolf. And um, before I close the episode, I'm just going to tell you what I think as well. Something I was thinking about the other day is, um, I guess when you really think about it that as humans um, we do go through cycles ourselves and um, we do use a lot of these terminologies today especially with um, it's important to say you know when there's a full moon um, I know that there are people in the emergency services who when they start a shift and they look at the full moon they go oh no this is gonna this is gonna be a hell of a night because this is usually when you know, people start to act a little bit strange. You know, you get the term lunatic, you know, or there's lunacy. Um, so you get phrases like that. So we are, you know, believe it or not, surrounded by this myth on a, on a, on a daily basis. And when you think about it, as humans, we do carry these traits. As I said earlier, as I mentioned, the, the word berserk. You can be carrying on throughout your day and you're probably having a nice day and you could have something like your car break down and you go, oh, damn, you know. And that is a transformation when you think about it, isn't it? You've gone from being really cool, listening to your music in your car, car breaks down, all of a sudden you go, oh, damn, that's it, I've got to do that. So you're not transforming into a wolf, you are, your mood's tran transformed. Um, and and I think both uh, male and female, we, we go through cycles. I had a conversation with someone a long time ago about um, you have women that go through a, a menstrual cycle uh, throughout the month. And um, I was talking to someone about the fact that men do as well. And they're talking about a cycle where it goes into a scientific thing. It's worth mentioning that um, it's something to do with your kidneys when your kidneys filter out all, all the badness and when it goes through that process they say that that can do something to your mood now that's for everybody um and think about it now just you know take this as you will it's just just an observation of mine but sometimes you wake up and you go god i feel i don't know what it is but 
I don't feel too good today and I can't explain why. I just feel really down in the dumps. I'm not ill, you know, I don't have a cold, but I just don't feel right today. And that, that could be like a little bit of a cycle that you go go through. So, you know, these are just, these are interesting topics, you know, go take, take it for a, what you will, but these are just things that are worth thinking about. So when you think about, you know, are werewolves real? Are they just floating around in Hollywood or folklore tales? But really, on a day-to-day -day basis, the werewolves are with us all the time. It's just the way you look at it. So, <laughs> a little bit of food for thought there, guys. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I will leave it on that. Be a little bit cautious when you see the next full moon. There you go. <laughs> all right, and um, so... Let's just do a little bit of um, admin before I close the show up. So I'm a proud member of the um, the, the Legion Podcast Network. Um, so please go and check out all the other shows on there, including my other show, which is Bite Size Cinema. I've just done uh, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels with uh, Mark Lockhart. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, and you can also find the show on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, several other players. Um, it's, all, it's all out there. If you type it into Google, it will take you to a place where you can listen to the show. Uh, I've got a Facebook page. Uh, that's where I'm most active. That's the best place if you want to contact me. If there's anything out there that you um, want me to have a look at, put it on there. I'm, I'm open to look at... Um, all types of, of mysteries. There's a whole ton out there. Um, oh, I haven't thought about what I'm going to be doing next because I literally just make this up as I go along, to be honest with you. It's just I could be driving down the car, uh, down the road in the car, and it just something will come into mode and I'll go, oh, yeah, let's do that. So I, I, I just let it go with a, uh, a natural flow. Um, so there will be something coming out soon. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, as always, keep it spooky, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. here in this If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.